except for whenever I tried testing the function, I just put in like a jump of some kind of random string for it. Uh -huh. That way it doesn't break it. Um, <coughs> so the best bet might be, let's go back to, um, So handle call, there's the request, and there's, that's the main message from. Um, sorry, I was just trying to remember if, trying to remember the details of exactly. So this tuple is being passed as that second from parameter. Um, is that maybe the name of the thing that the, it's coming from? Well, the request, yeah, it could be. <coughs> Um, I'm just trying to remember, so the register, okay, so register this name. So actually, this is saying register this name with this PID. I think this is the um, the process ID of the requester. Sorry, the person handling the call because a response will come back. Um, let's see. So I think we're not using Chrome. What happens? Yeah. I think what happens is. If you want to get the PID, you have to do the tuple. Because um, if it's just, if it's not a tuple, if it's just a single yeah, parameter. Yeah, you're right. We're not using from, but it, um, yeah, I think what you would put in there is, is though, the, um, the person who's doing the registry. So it's PID isn't, um, Sorry about the, I'm just trying to remember the details of it. Um, yeah, sorry, register name, best register it with the caller's process ID. So I, I think we actually ignore, I think we do ignore the, the from from part of that tuple. Um, here we show us a, a sample. Yeah, so the, the register name, which we call it, does, I'm oh, sorry, register, does a call, <coughs> sends register and name. So what's being sent is, well, the gen server call will, um, Basically, I think it just, um, yeah, I think we completely ignore the, the whole from, uh, the from, um, yeah, I think we ignore that underscore from. Yeah. Okay. Let me double check that though. Um, let me also, Right after 
class, I'll double check my own implementation and double check to see if there's anything that especially you need to do with that. Okay. Sorry I did not have the answer right off the top of my head. Other questions? Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So I'm trying to test it. Uh -huh. um, the way you would test it is you would say, um, so first you would make your name server. Right. Tuple, okay, comma, name server equals name server dot start. Um, because whenever you call name server dot start, it returns a tuple. Right. So this is an example of how you would start it up in the assignment. Because I'm not, I'm not too supervisor yet. I'm just trying to test name server before I do anything. Right, and you can just do that first part, name server dot start link. We'll give you, um, yeah, it'll give you a tuple back, which is a response, which I think is going to be something like OK. And then. Because um, if I do name server dot start, it doesn't break. But right. that doesn't test anything like the three. doesn't test register or resolve or any of those things. Right. You, well, you could then take that name server. Um, you would take the name server that you then would normally just pass it to top super, supervisor. And from there, you can start sending it messages. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about like, there's like an init function. Uh -huh. um, so right here, init is never called. Yeah, remember init for a gen server is a callback. So when you create the gen, when you create the, the process using that gen server code, it, the gen server behavior will automatically call your init function. So is that done by a supervisor, or is that done once they it's, it's done automatically when you create it. It's a callback. This, so as soon as you create this um, this name server, because um, remember the, the start link is part of the, the inherited gen server behavior, that will start up the process, but it will also then make a call to the, the named init function. And that's where you get to then set up your code. If I was testing just name server without the supervisor, I right. use dot start instead of dot start link. Um, I think so. Um, I would actually just go ahead and start it up this way. But um, yeah, if you did want to test it there, you could go ahead and. Again, there's an example of a name server to give you. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I think I think either one should work for if you're just trying to start it up to test. But in practice, in follow the code in the, the assignment for how to do it when you actually have that and the name server, that and the top supervisor. Okay, any other questions? Okay. It sounds like you might have more. We might need to take well, this offline and talk separately or I post them on Piazza. Pardon? Yeah. Um, so there's states. Yeah. And we're pretty much replacing states with our dictionary. Of that you're passing in, right. right. And the way that works is every time state is received as a parameter, and every time state is outputted as one of the outputs. Right. And then we never have to give it as a parameter. Um, that's always kind of added on to kind of like a decorator. With yeah. The things we're calling. Right. So you, ha you do have to make sure to to return it as part of that, that tuple that's being returned, and then use it when you get it passed into you on the call. But those just have, happen with the, within those callback functions for handle, well, 
handle that will init and then handle call and handle cast. All right. Um, so remember that that's due on uh, on Friday. And, and again, sorry for not remembering every single detail of every single assignment. I'll double have to double check on that. Um, so today we're going to wrap up garbage collection, and then hopefully, well, actually, I think at this point you actually already have everything necessary to start on the garbage collection assignment once you finish Elixir 2. Today we're going to wrap up some more about garbage collection, and then on Friday we're going to start talking about lazy evaluation. Um, at that time, I'll probably take a few minutes Friday morning just to take a peek at the garbage collection assignment to just go over any questions with that. Um, so let's go ahead and dive back into garbage collection. All right, so we talked about a number of techniques so far. Reference counting, deferred reference counting. Um, we talked about mark and sweep, mark and compact. Last time we talked about stop and copy. I just wanted to review Cheney's algorithm uh, because we were talking about it towards the end of class and I wanted to just sort of review it so that you, uh, just to double check and make sure you understand it, give you a chance to ask any questions and then again, this is going to be the last or the second of the two algorithms you'll be implementing for the, for the assignment. You'll be implementing or simulating the algorithm for mark and sweep and for stop and copy. So remember the idea of Cheney's algorithm is it's a breadth first traversal out from the root set. And the way that, you, that it works is, remember there's two pointers, free and scan. Both start at the beginning of the two space, the space you're copying stuff to. So you copy over, you take the things in the root set and you copy them over. You just, every, every time you copy them over, you just copy it whatever the current free pointer is and then increment the free pointer by however big the thing was that you copied over. So we copy over A and increment the free pointer, copy over B, increment the free pointer. And so this is the state after we've copied over the root set but haven't started scanning things. So remember the idea is we're going to copy things over and then we're just going to start scanning through what we copied over. So we don't need to maintain a separate uh, so for breadth first, often you'll be putting things onto a queue or other kinds of things like that. The stuff we've copied is the queue of stuff to be revisited as we go through. So we start scanning what we've already copied over. Remember the idea is every time we scan something here and see that it's a pointer. So in this case, this is actually, once we copy A over, A is living in this two space over here but it actually still has a pointer back to stuff in the from space. So while you're straddling in the middle of the copy, you're going to have some pointers going from the to space back into the old from space. By the time you're done, there shouldn't be any more, right? Because you're just going to treat the whole from space as dead. So it would start off pointing here, sorry, to C. So then you take that and you copy over C, and the key thing is at that point, you update that pointer. So instead of that pointer pointing here, you copy over C and update the pointer that, that you just scanned. Okay. And so basically, you get co depth first copying over, and you're updating the pointers all in one pass. Because remember, you have to update all the pointers. So when you copy over the root set, you actually update the root set right away. Then, as you copy each child, you update the pointer that triggered the copying of that child. We also talked about, so, we, sorry, we'd scan, we'd copy over C, copy over the other thing that A points to, D, start scanning B. As we keep scanning B, we keep updating, updating these pointers. We also talked about when you copy over C here, we're going to actually modify the header of this old sort of ghost copy of it that's in the from space to indicate C no longer lives here. That it's been copied, here is the forwarding address, and so anytime we actually are scanning and we encounter 
um, a pointer to something back here in the free space, and um, it's pointing to something that's already been copied, then we just update our pointer. So basically, you look at what, as you're scanning, you encounter pointers. If it hasn't been copied, copy it over and update it. If it's already been copied, just update it. See the idea? Maintaining these forwarding addresses is really important. Otherwise, you can easily copy things over multiple times or go into cycles or other kinds of things like that. You'll notice this automatically avoids cycles because I only copy something over once, and so I only scan something once. Questions about the algorithm? Okay. Do you feel like if I said, here is a whole set of, here's a chunk of memory and gave you the description of the headers and everything, that you could simulate this algorithm? Okay, yeah. So after you've copied like C over, uh -huh. all you're doing is chain marking the header so that it gets cleared out later, right? Uh, you mean marking <clears throat> this header over yeah, here? Yeah, the old header. So we're marking it mainly so that if we ever encountered some something else that points to C. Mm -hmm. So I think I gave the example before. What if B instead of pointing to E pointed to D? Right. So you just so that way you already copy copied over D. By up leaving sort of this forwarding address here, uh -huh. it avoids the duplicate copying, and then also tells me how to update this pointer when I get to it in scanning. Okay. D. So it'll have the new address of it'll where you have new, where you copied it to. Okay. But it's not used at all. The reason I wanted to clarify that is it's not actually used at all for any kind of collection process. Okay. We actually don't do any collection in the old from space. It's just later, I mean, once we've copied everything over, we just continue operating in the to space. Mm -hmm. And then when garbage collection kicks back in, we just basically, if you will, pave right over. We just start writing over as if it were all marked free. Okay. So there's, there's never any explicit collection of any piece of memory other than once I've copied everything over this whole place is this whole semi space is free and so do you always keep a pointer to the beginning of your like current space so yeah. that you can't like because if you just like started filling it up then you'd start like writing over right what, even relevant. so what you would typically do is you'd maintain <clears throat> a pointer to the beginning of one of your semi spaces a pointer to the other um, and you know, one could be marked as sort of the current from space, mm -hmm. the other the to space, and then you can basically just swap those, or you can keep two permanent ones and then keep one that's switching back and forth. Okay. Either strategy works, as long as you can keep them straight. But then within the current space in which you're allocating things, you'll have the free pointer. You, you throw away the scan pointer once you're done with the copy, mm -hmm. but the free pointer just keeps incrementing through as you're filling up the heap. Mm -hmm. um, and then when that reaches the end of the heap, so you, you typically would have either a size amount or some end pointer or something, when that reaches the end of the heap, or more importantly, when the free pointer plus the size of um, what you're now requested to allocate mm -hmm. exceeds the end of the heap, then you trigger garbage collection. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Understand the root set a little better. Right. So, like, given a piece of code or whatever, how do I tell like what the root set okay. is? It's everything. Everything that has a name that is in scope right now. Okay. So, in other words, remember, there's going to be an on-demand garbage collection. So, at the point in which the garbage collection kicks in, there will be things in scope. Um, and so everything, and, and remember, there's um, <clears throat> so there's there's things in scope, either because they're they're currently in scope, or as I perhaps pop back out of a function, they'll be in scope because they're on the, the stack. So basically, it's everything that um, I can get through to through a named entity, an identifier name, either currently in scope. So globals any pointers that are on the stack, and possibly things that are in um, a register or two for, for intermediate values that are maybe in the middle of passing something or something like that. Yeah? And is this the algorithm of like Java actually uses? 
Java uses this plus the generational variant that we're going to talk about just coming up. Okay. But yes, Java uses a variation of this. So let's talk about strengths and weaknesses of stop and copy. So it's totally sound. It'll never copy over anything that you're, um, or it'll never throw away anything you're still using, as long as you implement the algorithm to copy everything and not miss anything. Um, it actually has high, high utility, and it also tends to be fairly efficient. Now, the, the efficiency, though, comes in, the, in a couple of, or the inefficiency comes mainly because you're having to actually copy stuff. So the next thing we're going to talk about is how can you maybe avoid so much copying? Okay. Um, but the other big problem with stop and copy is in the name, stop and copy. So it brings your entire program to a halt while it does memory collection. So does mark and sweep. So does uh, mark and compact. So they all have that problem. So a question that people have asked for a long time is, well, wait a minute, could I do this in parallel with the program, the user's program continuing to run? And the answer is, it depends on the type of garbage collection algorithm you're doing, but also then um, there's, it depends on the behavior of the running program. So let me show you what I mean by that. First off, some terminology. So you have your garbage collector. Your garbage collector is part of the automatic memory management system. And so it's allocating memory out, and it sets up the headers. It does all that stuff so that it can reclaim it all later. So you typically have what's called a collector. But then you also have the user's program. Now, the user's program is modifying the state of the heap, not only through requests, but it's changing pointers around. It's doing all kinds of other things. So in garbage collection terminology, that thing that is changing or mutating the heap is called the mutator. Right? So from the garbage collector's standpoint, your program is the evil mutator that's changing everything around and mucking things up. Okay? So just terminology, collector, mutator. And so from this standpoint, in the collector, there's this root set of references that it's being maintaining for your program. That points into this heap. And again, this mutator is changing things. So some of these pointers might just start changing willy-nilly, just depending on what the program's doing. And so the question is, can I, the collector be going through and collecting things while the mutator's doing its thing? And if you think of this, remember we're talking about reachability from the root set. And so I've often described it as a graph. It, it's typically not always a tree. It might be a DAG, or maybe even just have cycles or other things. So there's some sort of what's often called liveness graph. The problem is the collector is trying to use that liveness graph starting from the roots and going out to what's reachable from it. But at the same time, the mutator is changing the liveness graph by switching you know, this pointer to here or other kinds of things like that. So if I make the mutator completely stop, then it's all static, and I can just use the liveness graph. But can I actually set up my algorithm to work if that liveness graph is changing? Now, in the case of mark and sweep, you've got a problem because, um, sorry. Um, you actually don't have a, a, a problem with mark and sweep. You do with the mark and compact. Um, so mark and sweep, one of the things about parallel processing is multiple people reading from the same data is usually not an issue. Multiple writers and synchronizing that, that's the issue. But the only the, the interesting thing about this is the mutator is changing only sort of the data part of the allocated block. <coughs> The collector is only changing the headers. Make sense? So for any piece of memory, there's actually only one writer. The header, the, the, the collector might be mark, going through and marking the different headers while the mutator is actually changing things in the data, the allocated data. So collector only changing one part, 
um, mutator changing another part. Now, whenever you have a copy collector, you've got a problem, though. That's right, so let's go back to this one. And so with mark and sweep, you can actually be doing your entire mark phase in parallel with the program continuing to run. The one gotcha with that is that you lose a little bit of utility, but it's usually well worth it. And what I mean by that is by continuing, by garbage collecting while the program is still running, you will, you're still guaranteed never to use something that, um, or never throw away something that the, the program might still use again. In other words, once it's dead and unreachable, it stays dead. Because okay? if I can't actually reach it, I can't create some new pointer to bring it back to life or otherwise, unless you have some those oddities like casting a pointer to a long or other things like that. So what, because once it's dead, it stays dead, the collector will collect everything. Uh, it, sorry, it will definitely not throw away anything that's still live. But if you're doing it at the same time, if the mutator is changing the liveness graph, the collector might miss some things that by the time it finishes doing the garbage collection pass, it could have thrown away, but it maybe already visited that and marked it as still live in the middle of some other marking pass. Do you see the idea? So the collector is going to traverse through marking things as reachable. But suppose it goes through and it marks this one as reachable and then this one is reachable. And then it starts going back to the root set and is traversing this one. In the meantime, the evil mutator of the program changes this pointer from here to here. Well, this one just went dead right in the middle of garbage collection. Those get missed. Okay. But then they get collected the next time through. So it's usually not too bad of a problem. You see the idea? So with mark and sweep, I can actually do incremental garbage collection. Again, the price is maybe I'm going to miss a few things I could throw away, but I'll just catch those next time around. Now, with copying collectors, mark and compact or stop and copy, you actually have multiple readers, multiple writers. Because remember, copying collector, I'm going to copy the data from here to here on you. Remember I said that works just fine because I'm updating the pointers so that the next time you come back and access it, you're still you're pointing, you're always pointing to the correct version. Now the problem is, what if that happens in the middle of some copying phase? It's like it, it's this is sort of like somebody coming, a waiter coming along and collecting your plate while you're in the middle of still eating from it, right? Now if you're not actually if it's between courses of a meal or something like that, or maybe, or sorry, better analogy, between different times you go to the restaurant, you might be seated in different places, but that's just fine. As long as they don't actually try to reseat you or move your pl uh, plate like while you're in the middle of eating. Okay? So, uh, all right, maybe not the best analogy, but I hope you get the idea. So you have multiple writers into the heap. The mutator is writing into blocks of data and the collector is moving that stuff around, trying to do writing at the same time. And that causes problems. There are some workarounds. It turns out that we can still do it, except for one small case that we're gonna have to, it's a special case. So the key to this is, so everybody okay on this basic idea? With mark and sweep, we're, we're good. Copying, though, you have to do some extra work to make it work incrementally. And the key is, let's think of these objects in the heap as being three different flavors. Or uh, some papers early on would sort of color them different colors, sort of black, white, and gray. And that's because we didn't have a lot of color printing, literally, back when these things were, were as common or as uh, research was done. Um, and this is called a tricoloring approach. So let's think of three different sort of flavors of objects that have been co covered. You have some things that have been not yet copied. So things in the heap 
that have not yet been copied. So suppose we've copied all the way through F, but maybe there's, there's stuff down here that hasn't been copied. It's still going to be copied over later as part of the algorithm. So you have stuff that is not yet copied over that's colored white. <coughs> you have stuff that's been covered, uh, uh, copied over but not yet scanned, that's gray. And copy over and scanned is black. You see the, the, the labeling? So copied over and scanned, copied over and not yet scanned, and not yet copied over. Now, let's think about this. What if I start changing pointers? So what if I was to, to go through and suppose that um, I changed this one to, suppose this one had, was a pointer to, so this white object was a pointer to some other white object. And I change it to a point to, a, say, a, a different white object. Does that create a problem? So if, if I change a pointer to now point to something that, um, let's see. Um, let's actually come back to this. Sorry. If I change a white one to point to a white one, does that create a problem? OK, I see some sh not shaking of heads. You're right. Why? Why is that not a problem? It hasn't been copied. So I'll resolve all that when I copy it. Okay. Um, what if I have a pointer here in a gray object, and I change it to point to another gray object? So these have already been copied. Is that a problem? So you're shaking your hand again, or head again, and you're right again. So why is it not a problem? Right. It hasn't been scanned. And so when I change this to point over to something here, well, what's all points to has already been copied. That's fine. And then I'll scan it. Uh, because I haven't scanned it or anything, it's all still fine. Yeah. So will you have to make that change then in both places, in both like memory spaces? Like, so if you're changing D to point yeah, to you D. Only change, yeah, you're only going to change it in one. <clears throat> Which is the new one. Right. Well. It depends. So remember I said objects are going to straddle the, the two semi-spaces while you're in the middle of copying. Right. White ones are still in the old from space. Black and gray are over in the new to space. OK, so if and you see. And the mutator will just still keep happily running along. Uh -huh. I mean, so imagine that you're just simply reading. Maybe I read from one pointer, and then in the middle it moves, and the next time I go back to access through the same, same identifier, I just access it as new. So if all I'm doing is reading, it straddles just fine. The question is if I start modifying. Actually, and if I'm just modifying data, that's not a problem. I'm just modifying the sort of the current live version. Um, but if I'm actually changing pointers to other things, that's where the problem comes in. Okay. Okay. So white to white is fine. Gray to gray is fine. Turns out black to gray is still fine, even though I've scanned it. Um, the thing that I'm now pointing it to got is I already copied over, so that's okay. It might mean that um, when I first scanned this, I triggered copying something over that later went dead. So that's the same issue as with Mark and Sweep. There are some things that by the time it finishes the whole copy phase, I've copied a few little tagalongs that really are dead by the time I finish copying everything, but I can live with that and I'll just collect it the next time around. Okay. So white to white, fine. Gray to gray, fine. Black to white, or black to gray, fine. What about, what if I change a pointer here, a, a pointer in a gray object to point to a black one? Is that okay? And it turns out that's just fine because Black to gray, gray to gray, gray to black, those are all point changing pointers within the new space I'm copying everything to. So those all work fine. There's one case we haven't talked about. So if we think about it this way, I've got some black ones that are already scanned. Those might point to some gray ones. Those point to 
pointer whites. It's not always like that. You're going to have pointers around. But remember, it's breadth first. Okay? So it will actually have a, a structure typically of the stuff that's been copied and scanned, copied and not yet scanned, and copied, not yet copied. Now, don't worry about the, the text so much, but look at, consider this case. What if I change this pointer that was pointing to gray, and I change it to point to white? Okay. So I'm changing a pointer in an already scanned object to point to something that has not yet been copied over. Okay. What can go wrong with that? Yeah. Well, D would never get copied. Say yeah. If that's the only pointer to D, so I, I change it to this is now the only pointer to D, and then something else that was pointing to D changes. If it if that remember things get copied when their parent gets scanned. So if you change it so its only link is in a an already scanned parent, D gets missed. Okay. And that causes problems because that's just not even existing anymore. Because this will now stay permanently pointing over into the other semi-space and you should never have, when you finish copying to the two space, there should be no more pointers back into that from space. Remember, you're gonna pave over it. Okay. Um, so the key problem is when you change it so a black points to a white one. And that's the only actual issue. So otherwise, if it's just reading, it's just fine. If it's mutating, all the other variants we talked about are just fine. You can't change a pointer in an already scanned object to point to, to point back into the old from space. Now it turns out it's actually really easy to catch that. If you go back to this part, Anything, if the memory address that I'm changing is before the scan pointer, I know that I've already scanned it. So I can detect black object. I, mean, I don't have to actually keep separate tags on, the, on that. If I change it to a pointer that's pointing back into the old from space, that's also easy. I can just do a range check on the pointer. So you can catch that, and there's a couple then different variations on it. One is, um, as soon as I point, change this pointer, to point over here to D, D gets copied along immediately. Okay. So I can actually catch now, but you notice you now have to put some special code in every time you're doing a pointer manipulation. So, but that code is basically, are you in the middle of garbage collecting? No, fine, I don't need to do anything, I can just change the pointer, yes. Okay, it's going to trigger some code that checks to see are you kept doing this particular thing that messes things up, and you just copy, you just trigger copying over D right away, okay. and updating that pointer to A. Um, <coughs> and basically, as other things get scanned, they'll get updated with the appropriate thing. Um, you can also try to do a, what's called a write barrier, which is basically. We're going to set that aside and remember to come back and modify the pointer after garbage collection is done. So it also means any accesses through that pointer need to be, you need to look at this special look, look aside table. So just be aware, there are also what are called incremental garbage collectors that can actually still keep running while your code is running. And don't bring it to a screeching halt. Questions on that? You do not have to implement that. I just wanted you to be aware of it. Last part, we may have to carry this over next time. All right, so generational garbage collectors. Here's the, the key issue. Suppose you, you're doing a stop and copy collector, and you have some large object that's been around for for that, or that just persists for a long time. You allocate it in the beginning, it's a really big chunk of memory, and it stays there through the entire life of the program. Well, every, the first garbage collection phase comes along, it's still there, it gets copied over. 
Next one comes along, it gets copied back. Next one comes along, it gets copied over. Back and forth, you're, cop you're, you're copying that thing oh, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth needlessly in a sense. Just doing it so you can do the garbage collection. So that turns out to be wasteful. It doesn't stop the, it doesn't affect the correctness of the approach. It's just wasteful. Okay. So we're going to look at what's called empirical analysis of memory usage patterns. And so there are people that actually do this kind of thing. You can instrument your garbage collector to collect data about how often are things allocated, how large are, thing, uh, are things typically allocated, how long do things stick around, and so on. You can collect all that data. And then you actually just run it with real live workloads. You just take existing programs, a set of them, and run them, and that instant run your instrumented garbage collector to collect the data. So some empirical observations. And while we go through these, think about your own memory usage in your programs. The first is younger 